Good afternoon from Brussels. It's uh, me again, uh, Jean-Louis Van Bella. I'm uh, an amateur physicist. Uh, it's, a, it's a hobby. Um, I found uh, that my uh, publications actually are going quite well in the sense that they um, uh, they offer uh, what I call a, a realist interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, so I want to come back to a problem um, which um, which is referred to as the anomaly in the magnetic moment of the electron. It's um, it's quite important as a problem. Maybe I can um, uh, trace the history of um, of the story a little bit back. Um, there are basically uh, well, there are a lot of interpretations, but the mainstream interpretation of uh, of quantum physics is uh, what they call quantum electrodynamics. Um, it's often also sort of referred to as quantum field theory, but um, I would say it's uh, maybe sub-quantum field theory. Uh, uh, we know that fields are quantized, uh, photons are uh, quantized. They obey the Planck-Einstein uh, relation, which I jot down here. Uh, we have a frequency for uh, particles, uh, the Bruce matter wave, and I argue that the Bruce frequency is the same as, as the Planck-Einstein frequency. We have a frequency for photons. Now, quantum electrodynamics is different in the sense that uh, um, it, it assumes that we have something like um, sub-Planck uh, scale uh, oscillations in the field. Um, how did it um, uh, come about? The key dates really are uh, uh, 1924, exactly 100 years ago, uh, the Breus uh, thesis uh, that not only light is quantized but um, and has a frequency, but that... Uh, there is something like the matter wave, which uh, I, I think is um, was a breakthrough. It's just a matter of how do we interpret that um, that matter wave. Um, maybe uh, for those who don't know me, I can quickly um, see if it's something. Yeah, so I wrote a paper on that uh, concept and issues. I think the frequency and the, the oscillation um, that you have in a matter wave is... Um, uh, it differs from the photon oscillation in the sense that it's not a linear wave. Um, I interpret these frequencies as um, orbital frequencies. And that's where uh, I will come back to um, my uh, Desmos oscillation here. Let me take the red uh, ball out. It's an oscillation in three dimensions. But where we can clearly see, like, um, if we imagine an electron to have some structure, what structure might it be? Um, we know that an electron, um, you know, scatters photons, and what we see in these photons is that either you have um, uh, uh, inelastic scattering, um, Compton scattering, where you have an incoming photon and it sort of, um, while it dances with the electron, it gets absorbed, we think. Uh, it messes around with the electromagnetic field that is generated by what we will call the... Um, um, the theta bewegung charge, a really very, very, very small charge uh, with a radius of the order of um, the fine structure constant times the uh, electron radius, the Compton radius. Um, we will write out the formulas, don't, don't worry. But so you have like a tiny little hard thing inside of the electron that um, uh, should explain um, a Thomson scattering, uh, elastic scattering, hard scattering, where the frequency of the photon doesn't change. Uh, because that electron, its structure, that theta bewegung charge in itself, it's a um, you know a structure that is, uh, as far as we know, is is not being disturbed except in high energy physics where you know for instance an electron and a positron would annihilate each other and, and other things. But in low energy physics, normal electron, um, you know this this motion will not be disturbed and the photon uh, will not impart some energy on the electron as a whole. And uh, so that's why we have Thomson scattering. So we know that we have um, two radii. We have actually three radii. If an electron is in an atomic or a, a molecular orbital, we have the, the Bohr orbitals, as it's called. Um, but at its scale itself, we may distinguish two radii. One, the, the ring current, the radius of the ring current. We think, uh, as you can clearly see, all the charges concentrated in a point-like charge, point-like, but not infinitesimally small. It has some dimension, I said, which is given by, you know, over the order of the uh, the Lorentz ratios or the classical electron radius, Thomson radius, it's all the same thing. So, um, I'm rambling already a little bit. So, let us go back. Um, uh, what what um, 
What happened is sort of in 1944, uh, we know that um, Bright, um, Gregory Bright, uh, saw an anomaly in what is called the magnetic moment. If you have a ring current and then you have a magnetic moment. So the magnetic moment of the electron was measured. And there was an anomaly. Um, for me, it's not an anomaly. It ties in with Schrodinger's hypothesis, uh, that ring current model. Um, the fact that we think, uh, well, you are measuring... Uh, uh, a point-like charge inside of the electron, and it has a size uh, of the order of the defined structure constant times the uh, Compton radius. So that would be normal that you see um, some kind of anomaly that the theoretical radius of a ring current, um, you know, current that is uh, continuous or or uh, given by a point-like but infinitesimally small um, point-like charge going around and around and you have sort of a theoretical magnetic moment but if it has a size then uh, yeah you would expect that um, yeah, there's some reality there and uh, and then you get uh, yeah slightly different um, a real measured magnetic moment uh, than the theoretical one the funny thing is after the second world war um that anomaly was not um seen as um being something that could be geometrically explained, uh, but no QED developed. It's associated with uh, Julian Schwinger, uh, a very famous uh, physicist, who died, well, 1994, so that's 30 years ago, or 100 years ago, uh, 80 years ago when the problem arose, and then 30 years ago, Julian Schwinger, who sort of, um, well, didn't solve the problem, but gave a factor which is famously known as a Schwinger's factor, the fine structure constant divided by two times Pi. He got a Nobel Prize for that, for um, interpreting that factor in terms of, um, well, quantum electrodynamics. Um, I will go to a, a very typical paper, uh, which I admire very much, which is very well written. Um, there must be others around, but this happens to be the one that I um, um, googled. Here from a guy called... Um, Ivan Todorov from Euler's play with infinite series to the anomalous uh, magnetic moment. And so the, he really does a, a, a great job at describing what um, what the issues were. It was not only anomaly in the um, uh, magnetic moment, but also this lamp shift. Um, I think I have a paper on the lamp shift. Yeah, there's a very tiny measurement. And um, we saw it, it added an additional um way of how um, elementary particles, specifically the electron and the proton, could couple with each other. Uh, for me, it's to be explained again in terms of, uh, you know, mag magnetic moments that, that are aligned. Uh, if we think of uh, a proton and an electron as having some size and, and being a ring current or a, uh, an electric current in, in three-dimensional space, then they will have a magnetic moment that can couple. So we have this paper here, you can see it explaining the lamp shift in classical terms. Um, but again, um, Julian Schwinger, uh, Isidori Zakrabi, uh, Gregory Bright himself, Hans Peter Oppenheimer, uh, Richard Feynman later, uh, they took this to develop, um, well, this theory, uh, quantum electrodynamics that is, um, described, uh, very well in, um, in this paper. What's the, um, the issue really? And, um, for for 80 years, since it was 1994-4, uh, we had these theories, and then we had finer measurements, and we had a bit of an adjustment of the quantum electrodynamics. We used the Feynman diagrams, one loop, here you can see it. Um, uh, you know, the electron, I, I would describe it as the age-old problem of the, the self-interaction of, of, uh, of charge. If we have a ball of charge, how do the, uh, the elements of charge um, interact with each other. Uh, why does a, a sphere or a shell of charge, why does it stay together? So they explain it in terms of, a, you know, a, a hypothetical interaction with virtual photons, and, um, and that can happen in many ways. Um, that's where Schwinger and Feynman, they differ. Schwinger um, had the idea, it's very much about local fields, why we know Feynman has this path integral approach. Uh, which strangely enough he doesn't he doesn't promote in his lectures from 1963, uh, although he would get a Nobel Prize a few years later. So um, it, it was making waves. 1965, Feynman, Schwinger, Tomonaga, very different approaches to quantum electrodynamics 
but uh, yes, the same, um, I call it a bit of magic, you know, electron, photon vertex functions, um, renormalization um, that gets rid of, um, of terms that uh, become too large or oscillate or don't, um, or don't converge. Um, I will talk about uh, my or the new, or um, it's not my interpretation, uh, a revival of what Schrödinger uh, found when he looked at Dirac's equation, his own equation also. A sort of, um, yeah, let's not, uh, sort of a structure of the electron. Uh, there's something tittering, titter bewegung, as a German word means, um, yeah, emotion. Huh? Um, at the speed of light, we'll come back to that. But before that, let me uh, illustrate here on PowerPoint a little bit what the issues are, what this factor is, what the series development involves. What we have here is, um, as you can see, this 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 thing here uh, would be the um, uh, trajectory uh, of the of the charge, the Zetterbewegung charge, which is this one here. Um, to um yeah so this the bewegung charge goes around and around and its center is somewhere here and this whole length here uh is um is the compton radius uh, h times h c divided by the energy and then we have the smaller um uh, sphere inside uh, um what we think of as the the, the core uh, the theta bewegung charge inside of an electron which has a radius i said of the order of alpha times uh, that Compton radius. So we will normalize uh, in our calculations a little bit and say like, okay, we equate this radius to one and then this radius is, well, is alpha. So um, what you see here in this, in this figure is, uh, and that was um, what I wrote like when I looked at this problem um, very early on. Um, this is a very old paper when I was still publishing on uh, Vixra. Um, the site uh, which said for crackpots, but I don't think so. In 2019, so that's five years ago, where I said, well, um, it's kind of normal if you have this model uh, uh, with with a, a, a point-like but but not infinitesimally small uh, charge uh, going around and around. Uh, that then you can see that uh, we get more bang for the buck, so to speak. Um, there is more charge. You see here this area. Uh, um, the area outside of this theoretical radius of the ring current is larger than the charge inside. So what what does this mean really? Well, um, an element of charge that is here would go around at the speed of light uh, V is equal to C, but these blobs of charge, uh, um, they would have a larger velocity than C. Slightly larger, uh, must have to do with this alpha, you can see that, uh, it's geometry. And then here inside we have uh, blobs of charge um, that go at a velocity which is slightly smaller than C. Now you can see uh, that's what I did in the um, in in my very first paper on it, um, which I will um, again. You see that this if you, if you want to calculate stuff, then um, okay, how much here I I show the ring current. That's quite important actually because the the mass or the energy of an electron we we say. Um, is given by nature. We have electrons and we have protons, they have a mass. But half of the energy is given by this um, kinetic energy of the charge that is going around and around and around at the speed of light. And the other is the electromagnetic field. It's a, a magnetic uh, dipole field that keeps that charge spinning. So it's kind of a perpetual model and uh, we'll come back to it. Very interesting. Uh, we can calculate spin factors based on this realist or um, yeah, calculation of uh, mass, etc. There's the concept of uh, an effective mass. There's a lot of stuff here, but let me come back to the um, thing. So here I I start to um, and that was five years ago. Uh, I I wasn't aware of ChatGPT or ChatGPT didn't exist at the time, or wasn't as good. I'm gonna talk about that a little moment. I'm very impressed by uh, uh, ChatGPT. Um, the new generation or one um, but I started sort of uh, fiddling around and calculating uh, you know using um, the small angle ap approximation uh, similar triangles uh, rectangular triangles um, etc to, to start calculating a factor um, of course I had hoped that I would immediately get a Schwinger's factor which explains the anomaly for 99.85% or I should say um, 
by Dover Schutz actually um, the uh, really measured uh, magnetic moment so it explains for 100.15 and then a lot of digits um, for more than 100 percent so um, and that's the thing I put here on on um, uh, I put here is um, yeah what you're looking at is this alpha uh, divided by 2 pi factor Schwinger's factor which I said overshoots uh, the, the 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 real um, measured uh, codata value of the magnetic moment it's a bit if you apply that factor I uh, say like okay uh, then then you get a little bit more so the second order term as I call it and you, you can see it from the geometry again you're uh, you find yourself really in a, in a sort of um, Oh, it's <laughs> it doesn't make you sleep. Um, approximating surfaces, adding them, um, making differences, uh, etc. And then uh, I will show you what I did now, uh, five years later, is actually uh, looking at volumes. Um, I, I will talk about it in a moment. Um, but back to where here, yeah, is uh, okay. So uh, we we can see that this game, this geometric interpretation, would give rise to yeah, a first order term as uh, some kind of um, alpha divided by two p is clearly something geometric. Yeah? Alpha is a is a radius uh, or the ratio between two radii. I should say between the uh, Thomson radius and the Compton radius. Uh, divided by 2 pi, so that makes us think also that uh, it's probably an angle or an arc length. Uh, so um, we, we get a first order factor. And then a second order factor, well, we see this correction, sometimes we add too much. Um, so maybe then the next factor should be a, a negative correction. And then probably it might overshoot it as well, so the third factor will be even smaller and positive again. In any case, you can, you can easily see that um, this alternative interpretation that I'm trying to push here, uh, which I call a geometric explanation uh, of the anomaly of the magnetic moment, that it could give rise to, uh, you know, looking at this uh, complicated geometry of the situation to, um, you know, a series of terms having uh, alpha in it, pi or 2 pi, uh, and um, yeah, first and second order and squares and, and etc. Um, I will not say too much about it. I put a few um, uh, characteristics of, um, um, because even within the Zitterbewegung interpretation as quantum, of quantum mechanics, as it's called now, there's, um, there's different mo electron models. Eh? There's, uh, there's a freedom of modeling uh, electrons. We a lot of work now on proton modeling. Uh, but mine is that, um, you know, the effective mass, uh, I would say this, this theta bewegung charge inside acquires a, a relative mass. So we think of a charge uh, not having any rest mass, but but because it goes around at and around at speed of light, uh, just like a photon, it acquires a, a relative um, mass, uh, which we refer to as the effective mass. Of the, and that happens to be... Um, half of the total um, energy or mass, uh, the equivalent mass of the energy of the electron, because we apply this energy uh, a partition, um, a key partition theory in which uh, half of the energy is electromagnetic, uh, is the field that keeps it spinning, and the other half is the kinetic energy of the Zitterbewegung charge as it spins around. It gives rise to probably why, why I get a fair amount of reach on, of, of, of what I call an oscillator model. Uh, we think about you know the energy in oscillation is the is proportional to the square of the amplitude of the oscillation uh, it goes up and down and the square of the frequency now um, when you apply only uh, when you only have one oscillator uh, then um, yeah, that's a clean up then um, you have a factor one over two um, and also the fact is that uh, with um, you, you can show the desk papers I refer to them. Um, the problem is the idea of a finite uh, of a definite cycle time and all that. You don't have that now. The the, the nice thing about thing is if you apply uh, an oscillation going up and down and then one going um, left and right, then you know you end up with a cosine and a sine, and you have something that goes round and round in tangential tangential velocity of that. That we recharge that we're thinking of will be constant equal to the speed of light and have a perfect um, uh, fixed constant frequency which is as said given by the Planck Einstein relation I may have lost you and I need to really um, uh, go back to my explanation of the anomaly of the magnetic moment um, so I would say read my papers the ring current model um, I said the interpretation of the matter wave frequency as an orbital frequency etc 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 
um, but I want to stress this: uh, you um, you do get this one over two factor. There's a lot of confusion that in, in CW wavelength interpretations, uh, it disappears uh, when you apply this formula. The total mass of the electron is uh, is two times the effective mass of the CW wavelength charge as it titters around. So let's now go to the geometric um, explanation um, and and where I am. So um, to be clear. Uh, let me go uh, here. So I was looking like, uh, can I find that uh, alpha over uh, two pi? And I was wondering, um, what is it? The fact that it has uh, there's no square, um, no no higher powers. It's just these two pi factors. So maybe it's an, an uh, yeah an angle or an arc length, etc. Um, any case, I, I said about without thinking. You know, I should get that factor. Let me let me calculate uh, volumes. Um, so now I am at um, fifty minutes, and I'm gonna really uh, start twenty minutes already. Uh, start talking about the paper I did. Oh, maybe. Um, yeah, no, I'm gonna go back to the the writings of some people I admire very much, academics, professional researchers who um, who are trying to. Um, do the same as I do, but do it much more professionally. Um, I want to go to, where is it here? No, that's the history. Mm. Ah, yeah, sorry. This anomaly, um, the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron, an easy geometric explanation. So um, I just wrote this paper, I finished it, I came back from a holiday. Um, what I do in this paper is, is two things, um, and I want to stress that. Some people were pointing out, and uh, I was, you're not using the right Codata values and uh, uncertainties. And I was going, yes, of course, I'm using the right, you know, I went on the, the NIST website. Uh, but I found out, and that, that's something uh, I want to stress, and why I believe that my beliefs are maybe more correct than others, is um, the Codata point estimate of um, you know values like the uh, electron magnetic moment, uh, not the fine structure constant, um, it shifted a bit. Um, the last digits, um, the last four digits are uh, uh, are different, uh, and so uh, I was like, whoa! Uh, if in a space of just two or three years, the last four digits in a in a in a, in a, in a series that is only significant up to you know eight ten uh, digits. Change, then we have an accuracy of only six, seven digits. So uh, that relieves some stress, I would say. It also shows that any claim um, that uh, mainstream physicists unfortunately make that this value has been measured uh, with an accuracy uh, of you know twelve digits or fifteen digits, and theorists as well that say, well, our QED theory gives an accuracy of up to fifteen digits that matches the uh, accuracy of the experiment. Uh, that's beside the point. Um, so that's something I want to note. Um, but so uh, I did do the the thing I had to do, and that sort of um, you also look at this Thomson scattering radius, um, as you can see. Um, it, it is a surface area r e squared to eight p over three factor. Um, I actually queried. No, I don't have chat GPT open, but you can query chat GPT. That's a geometric factor. Uh, it, it does not affect um, our calculations. In any case, as I said, the order of magnitudes are important here. Um, and then I go on to, you know, the anomaly. So we have a, a magnetic moment, a codata value for that, and then a theoretical um, value. Theoretical value is given by uh, the electron charge times h bar. Um, Divided by two times uh, the mass of the electron, or um, as I write it here, yeah, h bar c squared times the electron charge divided by two times e. I quickly want to show, um, I said I will go back to these papers, but a paper I admire very much, um, well, from a book, basically, let me show it. Um, it's about these new, um, sorry, unified field theory and Occam's razor, simple solutions to deep questions. 
And um, yeah, this is the book that um, I, I want to read. I'm going to buy. Uh, it's a bit over $100, but it's well worth. A Consistent Use of Electromagnetism and General Relativity. I'm, I'm not so much into that. At all length scales, so also the smallest, puts physics back on the right track, allowing a deeper understanding of elementary particles, these electron models, and their interactions. So out of that book, um, um, they uh, they were kind. I mean, I'm in touch with these um, uh, guys. They said, look, we've, um, that that's what we can write currently about um, the anomaly. Um, they agree well with our model that the mass is, has a pure electromagnetic origin, so it's charge, um, you know, with zero rest mass, and that means you know the slightest force on it uh, will accelerate it to the speed of light. So we have concept of an effective mass i would say and they write it down here um there's um yeah because of this geometry um the possibility and the reality uh, that the quadrata value is a bit different and they give the uh, schwinger's factor uh, uh, alpha divided by 2 pi they also note um i said yeah it's a series uh, this overshoots is a th third order they don't talk about a second order correction term third order because um alpha to the power three times eight pi divided by three i think that's related to that geometric factor that we have with thomson radius it gives almost exactly um the anomaly as um as measured so we would only need two factors in that case but the I said that the challenge out there is of course to to explain that alpha or divided by two pi to explain um swing as factor in a geometric way so uh, let me show how I, I went about that um So that's the um, the model here a bit. Uh, so we have this Tittebewegung charge going around and around and around. And you can see mathematically um, we have uh, uh, two spheres, a big one and a small one, that are intersecting. And uh, the intersection, uh, the plane of intersection is, uh, well, it's not a plane, um, is, is curved. So uh, that's what I said. You have a little bit more of that uh, volume of the volume of this little blue sphere. Uh, um, let me make it a bit bigger. Um, so you can see it. There's a little bit more of that sphere. If the center of that little sphere is uh, is really located uh, on that what we call well, the trajectory of the of the, of the current. Eh? Uh, of the of the point charge that goes around there's a little bit more outside than inside so you get uh, what i call more bang for the buck um so i'll go straight to the calculation because i played with this a lot and it's where um okay there's a uh, someone ringing at the door so i will quickly uh Apparently, I pressed the stop button instead of the pause uh, button, so I will have to glue uh, the second part to the first part of uh, my video. Um, where were we before um, someone rang the door? Um, we were here, yes, with this little volume, uh, the intersection. And as I show uh, what I did here, I'm going to go straight to that. Uh, is um, yeah, I had a chat with uh, uh, it was really good with chat uh, GPT 01. It gave me the formulas for indeed to calculate the volume of intersection between two little spheres, one with a, a larger radius R, uh, capital R plus R, and then the the D is the difference between uh, the distance, sorry, between the two centers of the spheres. So the um, the volume of the smaller sphere, uh, we have that, 4p um, alpha uh, to uh, cubed, and uh, cube uh, divided by 3. So um, you can calculate that volume. Um, you then calculate actually the difference. Uh, uh, you see it's sort of like a spherical cap, but not quite. Um, sort of an inverse spherical cap. I don't know how I have to call it. But we can um, uh, take half of the volume of the uh, um i'm sorry if i'm rambling a little bit i'm uh, a bit annoyed that um 
I, I need to do some manipulation on the video. Glue it together. Um, we can see if we take half uh, of the, the volume of that blue ball, the sphere that is going around, um, then um, and then we uh, we make the difference with that uh, the intersection of the volume. We will get the differential volume uh, uh, that we are looking for. So um, where were we again? Yeah, I'm really um, coming here. Where were we? Okay, yeah, here. Eh? So yeah, the differential volume, and then uh, yeah, let me go to my paper. The annex uh, is difficult to lose track. We get a factor uh, which is equal to um, uh, p divided by four times uh, the fine structure constant to the power four. Uh, that's a very small um, uh, value, but of course we need to realize it's a volume. So if we want to relate it to some uh, differential radius, uh, uh, an effective radius as I call it, then um, we should take a cube root somehow and probably some, some other factor. Um, I just took a cube root because this volume, it's not a sphere, it's uh, I said it's like a sort of a spherical cap. Um, um, that's actually an idea in the formula of the, uh, if it's a spherical cap and the difference is there has a factor of one over 12. Um, yeah, it makes sense. It's quite close to Schwinger's factor. As I write it about, there's only a difference about 12.5% with Schwinger's factor. And so, um, yeah, I'm thinking um, this alpha over 2 pi, maybe that's a, a, not a first order factor, but a factor that combines a few uh, correction factors. And the first correction factor that I would get out of my uh, geometric analysis uh, would be this one, 12.5%. And then um, I'm not going to pull up the chat. Um, I'm quite open on where I get the mustard, uh, as they say here in Belgium. Uh, I did query uh, ChatGPT01. It has a great grasp of the geometry of the situation. That wasn't the case uh, last year. And so I, I did iterate like in three or four times, um, you know, asking for what formula should I use if my assumption is this or that or that or that or that. So um, it is a nice factor. Um, we tried uh, another form factor, uh, I would say, for like 4P3, uh, if it would be a spherical thing. Um, you, you get differences that are, um, well, larger, uh, about 30% compared to Schwinger's factor. Um, but that's, of course, because the volume uh, is not a sphere, uh, the differential volume. So, um, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, that makes sense to me. It may not make sense to you, but I get something like uh, what I wanted to get, a uh, first order term, which is very near to um, a Schwinger's factor. And then, uh, you know, we can do a series development because uh, there are probably uh, other approximations. You will say, like, your approximation is quite, um, it's not an approximation. Eh? You literally um, calculated that differential volume and, um, and then sort of, um, well, you related it to, a radius. Well, that's the first thing. Um, I uh, related it to a radius by uh, taking uh, the cube root. Um, there must be some factor there um, that I don't apply. I don't. I don't know which um, factor I should apply to this differential volume. I said it's a very it has a very special C shape. The second thing, and I want to come to that now, is uh, this model is fine. But um, what what bothers me about my own model is that uh, oh well, you know, you get extra bang for the buck, so to speak, because a, a slightly larger portion of the sphere of charge is outside of the 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 the, the ring current and must move uh, at a velocity larger than c. Now, I'm probably quite particular in that, but I um superluminal speeds um I don't I don't buy. Uh, I don't like that. And also for the 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 elements of charge that are on the inside, um I don't like the fact that it's uh, slightly uh, um less than the velocity. So that brings me to um a different um thing here yeah set up a big spin so um yeah as i said the cd paper for the um, volume of the, the calculation of the volumes um but you can clearly see that's what i talked about here you know you you imagine a blob of charge on the inside um, 
of the radius and you imagine a block on the outside. For the outside, this blob of charge here, uh, uh, its velocity will be larger than C and this one here will be less than C. So we have, um, we can go to the extreme and say like, okay, we have a blob of charge here on the, uh, on, on the, on the surface of our spherical, um, Zitter bewegung charge, let's call it blob one, and blob two here um, is is uh, is there on the inside. So we would have this concept of uh, what I call an effective radius. It doesn't change the because people say you're fudging the radius. Uh, I'm not. Um, it, uh, it 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 you can clearly see the effective radius of this blob of charge um, would be one hmm, the the whole radius plus. Uh, this alpha, 1 plus alpha times uh, the radius of the big circle, uh, the Compton radius. So if we normalize, let's say divide by um, the Compton radius, we get 1 plus alpha. Uh, conversely, the effective radius of uh, the charge blob uh, 2 uh, is 1 minus alpha. It gives um, what I would call effective velocities, uh, but if you don't like that, it gives tangential velocities, which I said uh, I, I don't like because they're slightly different from C with the correction factor for blob 2 being this and the correction factor for blob 1 uh, being this. You can check, you get the same frequency because you adjust both the velocity and uh, and the radius and so you get the same frequency the frequency is this uh, the breve frequency or in this case here just the velocity divided by the circumference to p times the radius of the big circle so what's the distance um we can do that uh, the distance traveled over one cycle of what is ah now i need to come to this idea is um, if you don't like that, uh, like I do, that uh, we have velocities larger and slightly smaller than G, you should assume what you would expect um, if there is some inertia, or the idea of inertia, um, this, this, this thing goes around and around and around. Um, let me clean up my, my sheet as best as I can. Yeah. Um, we would assume that... Um, um, while this theta bewegung charge goes around in uh, one cycle and makes one uh, uh, loop, um, you know it will um, it will rotate around its own axis, and that would make sure that uh, we don't have this. Uh, we just have uh, you know it spins around and makes one uh, rotation um, around its own axis, while it makes one rotation around the, uh, the external axis, I would say. Eh? So uh, with what frequency? Uh, well, uh, the one I derived here, the, the frequency uh, C over 2P times the, the large radius. So this, this adds spin, zitter bewegung spin, um, but zitter bewegung spin, not of the, the normal, because the whole spin of the electron is zitter bewegung spin, right? But uh, the spin of the zitter bewegung charge, and this would add an extra magnetic moment, and the question is then how can we calculate that, and would it show up as a second order or third order correction factor in the explanation of the magnetic moment? Here I, I draw that again, um, so we don't have... Uh, Velocities of blobs of charge that are different than light speed because we have a uh, zitter bewegung spin. We can calculate uh, the magnetic moment of um, such a uh, rotating um, sphere of charge or a shell of charge. Uh, that's the I will use the formula of a shell of charge because for now I assume it's a, a massive. Uh, a blob of charge, our uh, zitter bewegung charge, with the charge uniformly spread out. But we may also think like, um, yeah, maybe it's a shell of charge. Yeah, if these elements of charge, um, they're all negative, uh, so they push each other to, uh, just like you would have for, um, you know, any, any physical larger scale situation. A charge resides on the um, outside of a sphere. Uh, a cage of Faraday, same thing. So, um, in any case, so uh, I asked chat 54 because I was a bit too lazy to look for the formula somewhere else. Uh, it's great. So they gave me this formula for the, of the magnetic moment, 2, five, uh, two divided by 5 times um, the charge Q uh, uh, divided by, uh, you know, these formulas use a charge density divided by the volume of a sphere. And you arrive at um, a formula like this, uh, 2 divided by 5 times QE times um, the square of the, the, the radius times the frequency. 
Uh, the square of the uh, of here is a small sphere. Uh, the frequency relates to the big um, to the to the big ball, I would say, to the electron itself. So it's a big R. Um, now I put here pro memory for a shell of charge. This factor two over five becomes one over two, which happens to be the same factor as you get. You know, if you would just assume it's a ring current, a shell of charge, three D shell of charge, and a two D ring current give you the same uh, form factor. I would say it's different for a, a disk of charge. That is one over five. Mm -hmm. um, but to make a long story short, um, is uh, it's this. Oops, let me. We can then have sort of a, another adjustment to the uh, that should explain the total. The real measured uh, magnetic moment is uh, would be like um, well this theoretical magnetic moment plus um, what we found uh, right now um, this r square alpha square uh, we have the uh, we normalize distances to to one uh, uh, while the Compton radius we equate it to one and. Um, times c so we get uh, this real magnetic moment over the one over two factor stays there one plus alpha squared uh, times qe times key so then we can uh, just like we did in our paper say okay we have this real total measured magnetic moment minus this theoretical moment divided by a theoretical moment and we should get a factor um while we hoped um that is um not alpha over two But alpha square so this is then like a second or third order term uh, that you would get um, when you adjust uh, for the fact that um, you know because of inertia um, the um, to the big charge will rotate around is this a solid argument you will ask uh, well no I'm struggling with it um, because we are mixing here two hypotheses we're um, we're uh, we're saying okay we we calculated that that extra volume. We also say that uh, inertia will lead to uh, this uh, uh, spin, extra spin, and that that will account for the second order. Correction, alpha square is about 0 0.00005 something. So um, yeah, that as a second or third order correction term, it, um, it does the trick, I would say. Um, is it a definite answer? I'm not sure. Um, but it's all uh, I can say about it. Oh, do I have a fourth slide? No, I don't have a fourth slide. And um, and I said that's um, uh, why I'm going to refer you to sort of do these calculations for yourself. Uh, I believe it's um, it it must lead to uh, well what I what I do put here is uh, convincing um, that uh, this. Uh, side, you know, a uh, geometric explanation, a uh, classical electromagnetic theory based on the realist uh, uh, assumption, as I call it, that a tittable wing charge inside of an electron or a proton has a finite uh, size, a very small one, but it's finite, it's not infinitesimally small. And, um, and that's it. I think um, I might work on this further, but I also want to close the uh, the topic i would say um because uh, you know you do get tired of these things but um it's also a video i'm going to use in discussions um, uh, with people who indeed question like okay are you using the right values the right code data values and um, does it make sense so there's a few points to note um one of them is that uh, the measurements are still uh, be being um, changed and it's not uh, nothing eh? it's sort of four standard deviations over a uh, uh, 4.3 standard deviations over, over just a few years. So an accuracy of more than six, seven digits um, um, is probably not likely. Uh, and so we must um, have these six, seven uh, digits. We must show that with um, our, our classical theory. Um, so that's going to be it. And I'm going to end here and see if I can um, merge the, uh, the two... Um, the two videos. Uh, maybe very briefly, uh, if you want to read a shorter article, uh, but it's also not... Well, yeah, you can download a PDF. Or, Rethinking Electron Statistics Rules from by uh, uh, the same authors of this book. Um, Kovacs and Vasallo, who talk about, you know, bosons and fermions, and uh, in, in a way I like very much because it um, it also confirms that sort of this local realist interpretation is is a, is a viable alternative to um, a QED. Um, 
do I have other things? No. Um, ah, yeah, I have here, oh, yeah, just to show that with ChatGPT01, I did have it open. Um, once you would arrive at a factor, uh, alpha over 2 pi or my factor, you can develop um, uh, a converging series very easily mathematically uh, with an alpha square, with an alpha cubed, uh, with an alpha to the fourth power uh, and coefficients in front of it. Here it says, uh, the coefficients would be determined by higher order loop calculations in QED. Um, well, I don't agree with that. It would uh, just um, uh, be determined by a, a better analysis of the geometry. Um, and that was the nice thing that I noted from ChatGPT01. Uh, it is um, when I sort of uh, asked it a bit out of the blue, like, um, you know, how could we explain the anomaly? It does give you the two options of saying, well, this is what QED uh, says and um, and this is well based on your hypothesis these are maybe some formulas so that's why i asked to export reaction one and reaction two in word but couldn't do that in any case i gave made the link to this chat uh, with chat gpt01 uh, public it's in my paper and um, so you can see how i moved forward on this question using artificial intelligence uh, it did not give me the final answers but it did help me a lot in formulating uh, the things I just spoke about. For the rest, um, I yeah, maybe I want this. Um, um, you will say, well, what does it matter really? Um, well, I'm still thinking about the watershed uh, conferences, uh, Solvay conference, for instance, where, and I'm at the point of uh, of Lorenz, where he said, um, um, you know, to board. You know, I'm I'm I, I don't see your new ideas very well, and and if they are uh, worthwhile, then we should still be able to translate things back to the old ideas. I would like to conserve. I'm reading here the old ideal to talk about the things that happen in this world in clear and well-defined uh, images. He calls it, but he means motion in in space and time. I'm willing to accept new theories, but only on the condition that it should allow me to translate things back to these clear and well-defined images. And that's um, um, that's what I'm trying to do, and in, in, in a sense revive uh, the ideal, I would say, of a, of a Lorenz or of an Einstein or, or an Ehrenfest. Um, you know, people who thought like this, um, uh, Ehrenfest called it, what did he call it? The, the, the unendliche Bohr Heisenberg Gewurstmaschinen um, Quantenbetrieb. Um, so, um, yes, and I'm gonna stop now because I see my uh, partner is making a lot of noise in the kitchen. Um, okay, thank you. So that's two times 20 minutes, and I will try to glue the, the two uh, together. I'm sorry for the interruption. I hope the sound is a little bit better than usual. And um, well, maybe I'll see you for the next video, but I, I said I don't think so. This is something I want you to think about for yourself and, and determine which of the two interpretations of quantum physics, quantum theory, uh, 